Hello, is that better? All right. Well, it's been 21 years. Thanks for waiting. You know, let's give a hand to this band right here. Are they amazing? If Dana just had a little more passion, imagine where she could be doing. Oh, thank you guys. So today I wanna, I wanna share with you uh, some thoughts and reflections that have kind of been inspired and I've been thinking about this idea for, for quite a while and uh, about the ideas of walls. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about walls the last couple of years. We had a president and a candidate who uh, talked a lot about building a wall. But walls are nothing new in our world. We've, we've had walls since the beginning of time. The Great Wall of China built in the 3rd BC could even be seen from space. The Berlin Wall built right after World War II was built out of fear of the other side. And walls do exactly what walls are supposed to do. They keep people in and keep people out for those that are inside or secure, but sometimes those that are inside are trapped. And so in the words of Ronald Reagan, let's tear down these walls this morning. So the most famous story in the Bible about the tearing down of walls is the walls of Jericho. Anybody remember that story as a kid? We're going to talk a little bit about what that message meant to the people of Israel. Now, before we jump into the scripture, let me give you some background. Remember that the, the children of Israel have now wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. I, I, I can't help but think if a woman had stopped and asked for directions, Perhaps they could have cut that, cut that time in half. But they, they wandered and finally they had reached this place called Canaan. But before they could enter Canaan, there was one last obstacle. And that was the city of Jericho. Now this city of Jericho had, had walls that were over 30 feet tall and at their base were over 12 feet wide. That's a pretty monumental feat for that time in history. And all that were in the city, it says, the Bible says that they resided and never left the city. So they were completely sustained within the city. And so Joshua, who was now leading the children of Israel after Moses had passed away, sent two spies in to get a feel for the land, to get in there. And as we'll read in the scripture, Joshua chapter 6, we're not going to read all 27 verses, I'm going to spare you that. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Have seven priests carry the trumpets of the ram horns in front of the ark. That's the Ark of the Covenant, if anybody saw Indiana Jones. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and the walls of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, and everyone straight in. So on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. The seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet, Joshua commanded the army, shout for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that were in it were to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all that were in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the walls collapsed. So everyone charged straight in. So I can only imagine what the military generals at the time were thinking as Joshua conveys this story of how we're going to take the city. And the children of Israel should not have been surprised. Remember, they had been delivered out of Egypt with those 10 plagues. 
And then they were tag, taken to, the, to the, the base of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army coming back to recapture them. And the scripture reads that those waters parted, whether physically or spiritually, however, they were rescued again. Then in the wilderness, when there was nothing to eat, God fed them with manna from heaven every day. There was a cloud that led them by day and a fire that led them by night. How in the world could they not think that God would do something unorthodox in this, in this moment? And so unlike the movies that we see, this was not going to be one of those kind of movies. I think we have an action movie uh, scene. There it is on the screen. This is what I thought would happen with the walls of Jericho, and they'd be scaling the walls and victory. No. They were to march around this city. And so just remember that God sometimes does things in ways that we don't understand. And how often do we forget that the, the mysteries and how mysterious our God works, we often forget. We all suffer from short-term memory sometimes, don't we? But all the things that God has delivered us from, and yet we still think God can't still do miracles. So if you're writing things down, here's the first thing I want you to remember. Sometimes God places walls for us to overcome. Sometimes God places walls for us to overcome. You see, even in the best season of your life, we are all just one phone call from our knees. Anybody remember that country song? And that happened to Adam and I in August of 2017, which is almost near this time, some four and a half years ago, when he called me to tell me that he had been diagnosed with stage three non-Hopkins lymphoma cancer. And when that happened, our whole life changed in a moment. We went from being just this happy couple to now being cancer fighters. But these walls, just like that cancer, we had to overcome those walls. And what we started to do is we stopped fighting with each other about the stupid things. And we started fighting the cancer together. And I was the, the optimist. Adam is, well, he's the realist. I'm the glass is half full, he's half empty. But I think that's why we make a good couple. Because we're able to balance each other. And he would go to Google and study everything. And I go, quit Googling your disease. It's only going to scare you. But when we stop fighting each other and start fighting the cancer, what a turn it took. And I'm grateful that in, in January of 2018, Adam went into remission, and this January will be five years in remission. As I mentioned, you know, God's plan seems unorthodox, and as we were going through that battle of cancer. I wanted to be faithful to the commitment that I had made to this church. And so it was time to give. And I, this was a Sunday after Adam's diagnosis and I pulled out my phone to, to give my, my offering. And he kind of got upset. He goes, don't you think God would give us a break? After all that we're gonna be going through, we're gonna have to pay some $14,000 this year and probably another $14,000 next year out of pocket that's not covered by health insurance. Well, that night, his mom, his dad and stepmother came to our house for our, his first treatment. And after dinner, they sat down and said, we want to give you a gift of $7,000. This is eight hours after Adam got upset with me. So... Two, two days later, in the same week, I get a call from a company, from a, a nonprofit that I had helped raise money from called Dream Fund. It says, Mitch, 
you've been unanimously nominated to be, to be a benefactor of Dream Fund. And we're going to give you three months and we're going to pay all of your bills October, November, and December. You know what that amount came to? $7,000. $14,000 in a matter of days. You think God tears down walls? But the story doesn't end there. So then we've gotten this money now. Then Adam uh, teaches fitness classes. Adam works out six hours a day, six days a week. Uh, not quite that much, but it feels like it. Uh, so he decided to start teaching Les Mills classes, and Adam has become what we call fitness famous, where random people will come up to him and say, man, you really killed me in that class today. Thank you for inspiring me. And I'm like, well, what did I, have I not inspired you? And so Adam's class got together and all wore these t-shirts on a single day called Heart of a Warrior. I think we've got some pictures of some of those. And it wasn't just his class that wore these. It was people all over the world that had heard about Adam's illness. And they gave us a check for over $2,300 from the t-shirts. You can clap, yeah. And not to embarrass Adam, he said it was one of the single acts of love that had restored his faith in humanity. That even strangers were there. I love this photo there. And so, just know that even though we don't understand the way and the path, that God is going to find a way. And it's going to blow us away. I, 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 I challenge you. Challenge God to something and see if he doesn't deliver for you. And it's not always financial. I'm not talking about giving to get. You need to give to give. Okay? Uh, and I, you know, I've got to pay your bills. Got to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay, I'm not saying don't pay your bills. Don't somebody sue me. Uh, but give to God what is God's. So, Let's jump back to the story at hand here. So there was this woman named Rahab, and throughout all of Scripture, she's simply known as the prostitute. Imagine having that as your moniker that people know you as. Oh, yeah, the hoe. Yes. She was a woman of the night. This is how she made her living. So these spies who got into the city, she protected them. And here's something I want you to remember. Sometimes your faith and the way you carry yourself can be an inspiration to others. It can be an inspiration to others around you. And that's exactly what happened in this situation. These spies had such faith in their God that Rahab goes, I'm going to protect you, but I want something in return. Will you protect my family because I believe in this God that you believe in? She may have heard the stories of the children of Israel and their conquests leading up to this. Maybe that's how she knew. But in that moment, she protected, she put her life on the line to protect these two spies because they found out the spies were in the city. And so they told her that we will protect you by putting a red cord outside your tower window. And when the walls collapse, you will be saved. But Rahab's story doesn't end at Jericho. You see, she would join the children of Israel. She would meet a man by the name of Solomon. And her and Solomon would have a son named Boaz. You know Boaz. Or maybe some of his relatives, broke ass, dumb ass, cheap ass. I had to throw that in there. And Boaz, if you remember, would wait for his bride, whose name was Ruth. So Boaz and Ruth would have a child, and his name was Ohed. Not one you'd probably remember, but he gave birth to a son named Jesse, whose eighth son, youngest son, would become King David. 
Are you getting the picture? From a prostitute came King David. Now fast forward a couple of generations, a very pregnant woman and her husband were headed to Bethlehem to pay their taxes because they were of the lintage of David. So from a prostitute, from a throwaway, from a nobody, from what the world says, you aren't good enough, came greatness, came the Son of God who would come to save our sins. So God, our, we serve a God of second chances. He gives us that opportunity to, to grow and he wants, he wants to love you right where you are but he refuses to keep you in that place. He wants you to grow in your faith and to share that faith and inspire others as these spies had inspired Rahab to have faith. Another thing walls do, and walls do exactly what they're supposed to do, is walls left unchallenged will lead to separation. Walls create separation. Uh, the people that we hate and resent, guess what that builds? A wall in your life. And I heard this years ago and I never forgot. It says the people that we hate either don't know or don't care. So we become the only victim of our walls. And if you allow those walls to continue to be in place, you will never truly love or be able to truly show love because the walls will filter that love. So when I met Adam 21 years ago, about six months after we started dating, I finally had the courage to come out to my parents. I think we have a picture of my mom and dad. That's Charlie and Christine. Now, my father is a cross between General George S. Patton from World War II, Archie Bunker from All in the Family, and Mr. Costanza from Seinfeld. My mother is Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Costanza. I asked my mother once, if, what restaurant would you like to go for your birthday? Anywhere in Dallas. And she says, the Olive Garden. I said, the Olive Garden? Why? She goes, I love the ambiance. I go, mom, no one has ever used the word olive garden and ambiance in the same sentence. <laughs> uh, that was my mother. And my father was not a very nice man. He was a strict father, he was a military man. And, and so, and he's from New York and he talks like this. So he makes this threat to my, my new boyfriend. He says, well, accidents happen every day. Like, what, are you threatening my husband with death? True story. Uh, but over time, my father continued to hate me, told me I was disowned. And for, I don't know about you guys, but father-son relationships can be complicated. It's, we all aspire to have a good and I loved my father and I wanted my father to love me, but I was so angry at him too. Well, 9-11 happens. My little brother Mason uh, and I went down, I think we have a picture of Mason, went down to, the, to uh, the recruitment station. Mason had just gotten out of the service. I'd been out since 95. They looked at me and said, we're good. But Mason went back into the service on that day. And he continues to serve to this day uh, in the military. So Mason in the military had a satellite phone so he could call my dad. But my father would always ask, well, where are you? He's in a war zone. And so my father at one point took out a map and says, okay, I've got a map in front of me. I'm gonna name a couple of cities. Tell me if I'm hot or cold. I'm like, I was like, is Al Qaeda listening? This is the greatest threat to America is Charlie West. Well, my, my little brother went radio silence and we all thought the worst. And my mother had pleaded with me to come to the house and to reconcile with my father. And my pride and arrogance didn't want to do it. 
until she offered to make macaroni and cheese. Now, I don't know if you've ever had my mother's macaroni and cheese. I think some in the room have. I've, my aunt and uncle and cousin are here. Uh, and, of course, I forced Adam to eat it. He goes, this is a meal? Yes. This is a meal. It's like handed down from God. This is what you shall feed your children. So she convinced me to come over, and my father was finishing up a phone call in the other room. He came in, he sat down, you could tell my father had, been, had cried, his eyes were red, and he looks at me and he said, I thought I lost a son to war, I don't want to lose one to ignorance. What? Is there a Hallmark card in there? And in that moment began what would become a new relationship with my father. A relationship that I had always prayed I would have with my dad. And that relationship continued until his passing in April of 2016. And now my mom and dad are reunited again in heaven as my mom left this earth in January of this last year. And do you know what her last words were? Thank God, America's in good hands again. She died on Inauguration Day. They kept her alive for a couple of days on a, uh, on a ventilator. And we all got to be there when my mom took her last breath. And that's the full circle moment right there. I don't grieve for my mother. I miss my mother. But I don't grieve it because of the fact that she was there for my first breath, and I was there for her last. And we'll see her again. So as I conclude and our band comes back, I want to share a quick story about a man by the name of William Borden. William Borden graduated in 1904 from Chicago, and his parents who were very wealthy, gave him a trip around the world. And it was during this trip around the world that he saw the need for Jesus Christ in our world. And he was inspired to return to China, one of the legs of his, of his journey, to become a missionary. And when he decided to do this, his family abandoned him. And he grabbed his Bible and he wrote down two words, no reserves. He walked away from his family money because he believed in something higher, a purpose for his life. His father had passed away as he was studying for the mission, for the mission field. And his family begged him to come home and to give up this crazy idea of being a missionary and do something with the family because you need to take care of our family. And he grabbed that Bible again, and he wrote down two more words, no retreats. Nothing was going to keep him from getting to that mission field and living the life of purpose that he believed that God had given to him. Right before he was supposed to leave, he stopped over in Egypt to study Arabic, and he was diagnosed with cerebral meningitis. And he died within six weeks. And when they went to his apartment to get the few belongings that he had left in this world, they found that old Bible, worn, and pages were torn, places showed traces of tears in that Bible where he had prayed and wept. And when they opened, just two days before his death, he wrote the last two words, no regrets. What a life. What a life to live. A life of no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. And that's the story God wants you to live. He wants you to be bold, and he wants you to be the captain of your own army, and go conquer those walls in your life. Walls of anger, resentment. Forget the things that have happened to you. 
God has given you the choice to either live free or live in bondage. Live with those shackles. We talk about those chains, the, the, the chains of tyranny that we broke off over 200 years ago in this country. Well, some of us allow ourselves to be chained to those walls in our life. So be like William Borden, a life of no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and I am so humbled to be able to stand on this stage again after 21 years and to preach the gospel. And this is only possible because of a woman who had a vision for a church where all would be welcomed, where all would be celebrated. And so thank you, Lord, for this place, for this incredible group of volunteers, to our band that lead us in worship every week, who sacrifice of their time and their talent to give to our church. Give us the strength and the courage to tear down the walls in our life that keep us from loving others and from you from loving us and us loving you. I ask these things in your name, amen. Amen. We're gonna sing this song one more time before we go lift. Y'all can stand with us to your feet as we prepare to leave. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Oh, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. No more walls, no more bondage. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free, yeah. Oh, no more shackles. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free, yeah. Sing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. No more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Pastor Gary, are you going to close this out? No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here for worship this week. Let me offer this benediction. You are created in the good and holy and pleasing image of God. God loves you. God is well pleased with you. And God hears your prayers. Amen? Amen. Go and have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Amen. <laughs>